Hello, everybody. Happy half term. And um, thank you for joining this morning. Um, on the calls, myself, Jeff Eden, and um, Helen Dowsett, both from SBS. And um, we're going to take you through just um, a real simple overview of um, financial governance and budget setting. Now, Helen and I actually did this session um, for some, some governors earlier this year, so we've adapted it slightly. Um, we're aware that a lot of you on the call may be experienced SBM, so you know, this might be teaching you to suck eggs a little bit, so we apologise for that. But the purpose of this is, um, is, is, is for it to be aimed at finance governors um, or any governors really who are new to the to the, the governance process in your in your schools or your trust, but also for any any staff among you um, or any staff that you have in your schools that might be new to schools finance from, you know, from the school side, from the operational side. So please feel free to share the recording with them if you think they will find it useful. Um, and as we said, it's an intro into finance governance and budget setting. So how, how is a budget set? Where does the various bits and pieces come from? But then also a focus on the kinds of conversations that you as um, as SBMs or finance people in schools can expect to be having in, in finance meetings with your governors, but also the kinds of questions that they should be asking you. Um, a quick intro to SBS and SEG. Um, I'm sure that many of you have seen these um, these coffee clubs before would have seen this information. So just very quickly, SBS founded several years ago now, 2007. Um, we're a consultancy company that helps um, schools with a variety of different services. So finance, ICT, budgeting. So we have our own budgeting software, MIS, procurement, etc. cetera. Um, you, you'll know all this, I'm sure. But um, SEG, we're, we're a part of SEG, having joined the, um, the group a couple of years ago, um, lots and lots of useful partner companies um, and therefore I think we support um, numbers of schools in the five figures, so 12,000 dish schools uh, as a group. So a lot of experience and a lot of useful information in, in, those, uh, in, those, in those shared companies through SEG. Right, let's get on with the proper stuff. Um, so a little um, overview of financial governance um, from how it's written and how the, the government sets out it should happen. Um, they say that the responsibilities of the governing body or, or the board should ensure that these four things are happening so that resources are, are deployed soundly. So that means that, you know, money is spent wisely, um, the resources you've already got in the school, staffing or, or things, assets are being used properly. Um, that the school or the, or the group of schools you're in performs well, so that targets are set at the beginning of the year, those targets um, are met, um, balanced budgets are set, and that the school obviously doesn't, doesn't descend into, um, into a deficit for any reason. Um, the financial loss or and wastage is avoided because ultimately the, the funds that the majority of the funds that schools are given are, are public funds, so it's really important that they're they're used properly and then they're not wasted and that proper processes and procedures are followed so that when it comes around to audit time, um, be it done by your LA or, or an external auditor, um, those those audits um, produce favourable reports. So those are the, um, the responsibilities ultimately of the governing body. So when you have conversations um, with your governing body, uh, and if you're a governor, if you're if you're talking to your finance people, those are the sorts of things that you should be you should be focusing on. So Helen's going to sort you through the key roles. Yep. Um, so obviously the key roles of your governors or your board are to um, manage the school budget. Now we all know that in finance we tend to manage the budget but they should be having an overview of that budget making sure that they understand what's being spent how it's being spent and have obviously some decision in how that school budget is being spent now obviously again there's obviously that delegated amount so you'll have your head teacher that will be allowed to authorize things up to a certain um, value and obviously that will go down into the finance team and also the budget holders but ultimately it is the, gov the, the governor's and the board's responsibility to understand how that's being spent and to have some say in it. So especially if it's sort of expensive things, it should be going off to them to be able to um, authorise it. Um, they should be ensuring that the records are being kept accurately. Obviously, again, you'll be doing the record keeping, but 
they should be checking on that, making sure that everything is being checked and also making sure that obviously you're following those procedures because it, you can't manage yourself in that sense. We, we all need somebody to overview and make sure that what the school or the trust has decided is what we are doing. Um, they are ultimately um, allowed to set the staffing and set the pol pay policy. Again, most of it's delegated down, but they should understand why we've got that staffing, why we've got the policy and to be able to make recommendations and approve anything that's going on with the staffing. And really importantly, they should actually be a critical friend to the head teacher. They should be supporting, criticising, um, advising, just providing feedback and being able to be that person to bounce ideas off of and to support you through that budget setting and any other areas that sort of finance come involved with with governors um, they shouldn't be feared they shouldn't really be there to um, sort of just make your life more awkward they should be there to support you and actually help you get to the right point for the school I know we often see them as they're coming in and asking lots of questions and maybe not the right questions but that's where something like this can support them so how we can help them to understand what it is that we're doing in finance and how we're writing that budget so when they're coming to review it and they're looking at the expenditure and the income they understand it so they can ask the correct questions to ensure that everything's flowing correctly rather than maybe just asking why something's gone up by 50 percent when actually that's not a massive deal because it's only actually gone up by 100 pounds or something because it was just a small a small budget OK, so we're just going to move into the budget setting process. So obviously, as you know, we always need to set at least a three year budget. Five year is um, quite standard now, but at least a three year budget. Um, but it's really important to actually help your governors understand what the budget is made up of. I've worked with a lot of governors in the past where they understand that we get income, we get expenditure and they want it to balance, but they don't really understand the differences of each of the areas. So. So spending that time with them to help them understand that, you know, we have the allocated income, which is obviously from obviously our LA or our ESFA. Um, and how that's how that's come about, you know, what are the what are the underlying figures to that? Is it done on, you know, the pupil numbers? What's the deprivation figures in the area so that they can actually understand that that funding so that it makes sense when you say oh, we're gaining 20 students or losing students and how that's going to affect your budget going forwards. Also understanding any other grants, some of them will obviously again be things like pupil premium, which is a standard amount. You're going to get it for all of the pupil premium students and it's an amount per pupil depending on different factors. Um, but also understanding what is guaranteed income and what isn't. I think a lot of um, governors seem to just look at the income and go, OK, the income's great, but they don't understand that some of that is made up of sort of self-generated income, which is a little bit of a we're not 100% sure how much we're going to get. This is what we've done based on last year or based on the bookings we've currently got. But I don't think any of us saw COVID coming and obviously that would have made a massive difference to the self-generated income. So them understanding what is actually um, guaranteed and what isn't guaranteed is really important when it comes to the governors. Uh, staff costs, uh, obviously, as we know, are hopefully under 80 percent. I suspect that's probably creeping up a bit at the moment with the pay increases and the um, the funding not going up as much. But, you know, again, they need to understand that majority of their expenditure is coming from staffing. So that's where their focus needs to be. You know, there's no point focusing on the fact that you've given the maths budget an extra hundred pounds if the staffing costs are up at 85, 86 percent, because the hundred pounds to the maths department isn't going to make any difference, but the extra five, six percent to the staffing costs is really going to make a difference to your budget. Um, and then obviously understanding what the non-staff costs and what can be cut and what can't, because obviously, again, when you're looking at budgets, the governors are going to be asking where can we make savings and understanding, you know, that really only 20 percent of their other expenditure is sort of non-staffing and how they can sort of look at those areas. And we're going to come into some of these things like the contracts and things like that in a minute, um, about how they can understand where they can cut or where they can actually support to help you make savings or um, balance that budget. And then obviously really importantly is for them to understand all the underlying assumptions that you've made to that budget. Again, we know what the, the inflation rates roughly are going to be based on talk. Obviously, I know it's always a bit speculative, but we've got some idea. They may not. So understanding why we've put that inflation in, 
where, how we've come across that figure. Even if it's just included in the report that you give them that they can read if they want to. So then they're not asking questions as to sort of like, why has it gone up 20%? Hopefully not, but you know, how much has it gone up by? And we can sort of work with them and then they can obviously again, challenge those assumptions to make sure they are correct and sort of make sure that we've got them from the right area and we're not just going on, well, it's what we did last year. Um, Jeff's going to take you through the assumptions. So we thought it'd be useful to put in a, um, a, a list of some of the assumptions that we we regularly um, put into school budgets. Um, so if you shared this with your, your governors, they can then ask ask you about them later. So pupil number projections. Um, some head teachers and, and, and uh, are good at projecting pupil numbers. Others tend to do well, it will be will just be full every year. Um, it depends on your school, but that that is really important for governors to understand that that drives the main tranche of your of your income. So it's important to get that right. Other income levels, so which grants are stopping, which ones are carrying on um, and in and indeed the same is true of self-generated income levels. What what do we think is going to happen to those income levels over the next two, three years? The biggie is obviously going to be staff costs. So, you know, um, have they have you included an inflation amount year on year for staff? Um, a real tricky one at the moment because uh, obviously the government's looking to introduce over the next two years its minimum thirty thousand for uh, main scale teachers. Uh, that's outside of London, but that's having an impact on all pay scales um, across all regions. Um, so, for example, I've been working with a trust um, to help them set their budget. And what we've done is we've included what we think will be the um, the major increases for for uh, teaching staff over the next two years. It's had a major impact on their budgets. It's tens of thousands of pounds across the trust that is added to budget. So we've really had to think about if that does happen as it looked like it's going to um what else do we need to do to mitigate against um, schools going into a deficit um so they should also be asking you about increments have you made sure that you've incremented everybody through m what about teachers on up um have you assumed that some teachers are going to apply to go through the threshold um and go on to up2 or up3 um have you included promotions allowances all those kinds of things and then apart from inflation um, on on support staff and teaching staff, you've also need to think about um, inflation on utilities and your other non staff costs. And finally, what happens with your top slice and your de delegation? Are you keeping uh, if you're if you're on mat, are you keeping your top slice the same? Are you being a bit kinder on your schools? Um, is it going to be enough to pay for your central team, etc? So. This little list here is, is some things that um, governors can ask you about, um, but it, it is, these are the sorts of things that you can talk to your, your governors about as well to make sure that they understand where some of the pressures on, on your budget may be coming from. So focusing on staffing, um, there are a lot of pressures on staffing at the moment, which is going to be um, sending that number uh, through the roof over the next couple of years. Um, we all know about short short term absence due to COVID, so people catching COVID, having to isolate, not being in work. Long term staff absence due to COVID or otherwise, that just seems to be on the increase. Um, now, coupled with that, you've got rising agency costs. Um, again, it, just referencing the trust I work with, the, the daily rate for teachers has gone has gone up by 10 or 20 pounds a day over the course of the last 12 months. So that's been factored into their budget next year that if if staff's absence continues in, in the vein it has been, that the agency bill is going to be a lot higher. Um, lots of people talking about recruitment difficulties, struggling to get good staff, keep good staff, um, fill certain roles. And there even seems to be much more of a, um, a, a vein these days of, of teaching staff negotiating salaries on appointment um, or or newly qualified teachers somehow managing to start on on something a lot higher than m1 um, it's happening in a lot of trust that i've that i've been working with so um it seems that you know even though you think you may be employing somebody on a certain rate it may end up being higher we've talked about the commitment to pay thirty thousand to um, main pay area teachers 
and that's having a massive impact on on staffing costs over the next two years and indeed if you're unlucky to be in a in a, in a region where there's an lgps black hole that may be having pressure on your on your staffing costs as well so there are lots of things to discuss and talk to um governors about as to to explain in a bit more detail where the pressure on your on your budget is coming from and it could be one of these or any number of these at the moment Okay, so we're just going to go through some of the conversations that we can have with our, our board and our governors that can maybe help them understand these, the staffing and why it's such a big percentage of our budget. Obviously, it's a massive percentage, it's, it is what it is, but obviously if they're not working in schools, they might not understand exactly everything. So why have the assumptions been made? What, what assumptions have we made and why did we make them? Um, have we done it on best case scenario? Have we done it on worst case scenario? Have we done it sort of somewhere in the middle or have we done multiple budgets where we sort of we've got sort of somewhere in the middle, but we can also show them the, the worst case scenario? You know, we, we might have heard that there's an inflation going up to 5% for teachers or something like that. We might want to do a budget for them that can show them that without actually having that as our main budget because that's not being confirmed. Again, are the assumptions realistic or do they build in too much of a buffer? Have you put in 5% inflation because it's happened in the past, but actually all the conversations are saying it's going to be 3% this year. You know, are you then sort of, yes, it's great, you might make some savings, but actually are you then cutting down a budget that need, that doesn't need to be cut down and could actually um, support the school in another way? So they should be asking these questions and you should be helping them with these questions and sort of supporting them through it. Um, again, vacancies, you know, how are we recruiting for vacancies? Are we always recruiting sort of, as Jeff said, sort of newly qualified teachers, but they're managing to, um, to sort of negotiate the salary up? How can we come around? Is there anything we can do to sort of not have to have these negotiations, put something in place? Because yes, we want the teachers, but if you're getting newly qualified teachers at a sort of like a higher level, then qualified teachers that have been around a bit longer are going to want to be even higher up. So we're going to need to sort of think about that. Um, they need to be asking you if you've been, if there's any efficiencies that can be made. Obviously, and we know you would have been looking at this, but they should be challenging it and going back and saying, OK, well, actually, no, why are we paying for that? What is it for? Especially when you've got large budgets, you know, maybe to do with contracts again, which we will come into in a minute. Um, they should be asking about the pupil numbers in the area, knowing whether or not that's going to be going up or down, how that's going to affect staffing. Does that mean you're going to have too many? that could then mean you've got to pay for um sort of agency staff so understanding all of these areas um again does the school need to recruit or allow for natural wastage it's a conversation we don't like to have to have about you know staffing levels and if the pupil numbers drop naturally something has to happen hopefully a bit of natural wastage somebody retiring moving on to another school might mean that you don't need to make any drastic changes but they need to understand that because if they do need to make drastic changes they need to know about it in advance because as we know it's not a slow process and also are, are the staff are good staff in the right roles so making sure that the staff in the school are all on board with everything that's going on and they are being supported through that as well OK, so we're going to just go into contracts. Now, we all know what our contracts are, hopefully. So we're going to have things like our ICT contracts, our software, um, catering, cleaning, licenses and subscriptions and obviously photograph, photocopying. Sorry. And then there's probably other subscriptions that you will have little ones in schools, big ones, depending on the type of school you are. But having a contracts ledger, so if you've got um, either within your finance system or a separate sort of spreadsheet, which will have all your contracts in it, or even within your budgeting tool, just to make sure that your, your governors can actually see what those contracts are. They can see when the end date of them are. And actually, you can then make sure they can make sure that they're not just going through an auto renews where you're getting then the however much inflation year on year because you're out of contract. But actually making sure that we are going through that tender process, we are bringing them back in house and we're getting them set so that we know how much they're going to cost us for the next three years and we're not going to suddenly come around and go, oh, they have put a 5% inflation on and we're under the 90 days to give notice. We're going to have to just pay it for this year. So 
these are the sort of things that you should have prepared for them and they should be asking you. So they want they should know where your contracts ledger is and they should have access to it. So they should be able to see that at all times, whether that's a live spreadsheet or something you just provide to them as part of the governors or board meeting so they can see it. Something that's really clear. They need to know what contracts we've got because schools can get into issues where, especially if you're moving into a trust or where, you know, you might end up paying for two contracts because the trust's paying for it, it's coming out of your top slice and you're paying for it. So if you don't know what contracts you've got, you might auto renew and end up having to pay for an extra year. Are they value for money? And that doesn't always mean the cheapest, but are they value for money? Are you getting a good service out of them? Is it worth what you're paying for them? If it is, great, go out to them. If you're not in contract, go out to them, see if you can sign yourself up for another sort of two years, three years and fix the, the value. If they're not value for money, go out and do a tender process. The, the, the governor should be asking you what you're getting out of each of those contracts. Is there a more cost effective solution? As I said, value for money isn't always the cheapest, but when things are tight on budgets, if there are two systems out there that do pretty much the same thing and one's cheaper than the other, then the cheaper option is possibly going to be the best solution, but not always. But they need to know why it's not the best solution. So not just saying to them, oh, yeah, we love this product, so we're not going to change. There needs to be a reasoning behind it rather than just we're used to it, which obviously is a big reason but there should be some evidence to back that up. They need to know when the contracts are up for renewal and more importantly, how much notice needs to be given because they should be challenging and saying, well, actually, you know, we've had this contract for five, six years. Yes, we know it's great. We've auto renewed it. We've signed it back in. But actually, is it time to go back out and have a look? Because even if you stay with the same company, it might be that they um, reduce the value back down or actually things have changed a bit and there's a better contract you could be on within that company. And if you just auto renew, you're never going to know that. Um, again, will the supplier offer discount for multi-year deals? Most suppliers will offer you a one year value, a three year value and a five year value. Now, obviously, five years is a long time to sign yourself into. Again, though, if you love the product, it's working for you, it does everything you're getting and you're getting value for money for it. Why would you not sign in for five years? Bring the cost down, save some money. You know, energy costs are going up massively at the moment. If we can bring down some of the other costs, it might help us be able to pay off some of those energy bills that we're going to have to come across. Um, again, they need to know whether or not actually changing supply will trigger a tender process, because if it's 90 day notice and they say in you decide at day sort of 95 that you're going to give notice have you got time to do a tender process so they need to know what the what the process is going to be how long they need to give notice on and what the tender process is for that and then what the impact on um, processes procedures if contracts are changed so that's where it comes back to the value for money it's not always the cheapest and it's not always because we we know it, but that does become part of it. If you know a system and it's working and it's a big system and it's value for money, you, you know, it's not three times the price of anything else out there, then actually knowing a system will be important, but it should be part of the factors, not the whole factor. And um, so just going to come into a couple of sort of tips now. These are things that maybe you might want to pass on to your governors or if you're new to finance tips that you might want to um, sort of make sure you understand as well. So sort of governors should know where the school income comes from and why it's coming from there, how it's funded, who's giving it to us and what is guaranteed and what is not. We all know that the funding statement changes each year. We know the baseline figures change. They don't change much. Um, and we know staffing costs and everything else is going up. So they need to understand what they can do about that income. Is there anything that they can do? You know, is the school at capacity? Is there any way that as a school or a trust we can try and boost pupil numbers? Or is it down to actually understanding what else we can do as a school to raise income that's not part of our GAG funding um, and other funding grants, you know, is there any way we can do extra lettings? Can we rent out the car park because we're in a town centre at the weekends, and you know, pay for parking and save, get some extra money that way? You know, governors should be asking these questions and should be helping you with ideas. Um, the governors should actually have an understanding of local pupil number trends. Now, obviously, for a governor in a school, that's quite easy they're normally quite local especially sort of primary schools you've got the parent governors and things like that 
but they still need to know what's going on in the area. For trusts and boards, that's a bit more, the board, the trustees of the board are a bit more complicated because obviously they might have schools all over the area. But they should still know what's going on in each of their areas so that they can understand how that, that budget is going to either be hit or have a good impact on it. Um, obviously, they need to know the difference between the support and teacher costs and the on costs. You know, we all know that if we advertise a salary at 30,000, there's the on costs on it. But do the governors know that? Do they know that when they're saying, oh, yeah, we can employ somebody at £30,000, what the true cost of that is? So actually understanding all of the costs associated with, with um, staffing is really important. Um, they should be making sure that there is um, reforecasting being done and that they're getting reports on actuals. You know, they should know that if you're on target for your master budget or whether or not you've had to make changes, where those changes have been made and have you made savings somewhere else? You know, if, if if your agency costs have doubled during COVID, which I know a lot of schools have, if not tripled, um, is there any way that you've been able to make some savings or are we going to have to dip into reserves or are we going to end up with a non-balanced budget? Um, they should be challenging the overspends and underspends. I know a lot of governors will probably um, challenge overspends and they'll say, right, so why uh, why have we overspent by X amount on this budget? But they don't tend to challenge the underspends. That's great. We've underspent. Brilliant. Move on. But actually, why have we underspent? Have we over budgeted? Are we not actually managing the, the budget correctly? Should that have been moved into a different area? Should be challenging that and helping you understand or well, help they should understand the budget so that, that can help them with, when they're speaking to you. And they shouldn't be afraid to ask questions. I've worked in schools. Um, I'm not going to lie. My governors were great, but they always didn't ask questions. I think they were afraid and they, they didn't want us to feel like we were just sort of answering questions that were basic. They should be asking questions. They should ask as many questions as they need. But importantly, from the finance side of things, if you provide them with all of this information, if you help them understand where it's all coming from, those questions won't be the basic questions. They will actually start helping support you and hopefully challenging you, which is their role, according to the DfE. But we know essentially most of the stuff's done in finance. It just gets passed up. We say we recommend this and the board or governors just sign it off. But they are actually essentially responsible, so they should be challenging it at the least. And so that's the end of it. It was a short one today. Oh, it's a bit longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, has anybody got any questions? You can put them into the chat. Um, Jeff can answer them because I haven't got access to it. But yes, please do ask away. As we said before, the um, this was recorded this session. So um, if you feel it would be useful um, for your governors to have a look, um, please feel free to pass it on to them. Um, you should get an email with the with the recording link um in due course so we've got a question from julia it says uh, for teaching costs in 22 23 and 23 24 have you used the evidence from the government to the strb um so yes um what what um it from with our software heads on what we did in sbs budgets um is that we we put those values straight into the into the software and they're available as um, provisional tables for 22, 23 and 23, 24. So um, yes, um, with the, the trust I referenced earlier, we've used those assumptions and just removed any inflation we had um, because it those those figures do include the recommended um, increase to teaching teaching costs. Um, and Vic asked, will we be sharing the slides? Yes, I think we will. Yes, we will share the slides as well. Problem. Yeah. And if you've got any questions afterwards, um, obviously, if you don't want to ask them on here, um, I'll just go back one slide. There's our email addresses. Feel free to just drop us an email um, and we'll come back to you on it. OK, guys, well, there's no more questions today. Um, we'll we'll call it a, a day there. Um, have a brilliant rest of the half term. Um, we will send around the recording. As mentioned, it was a, a short and sweet one today because we know that a lot of people um, are on holiday already. Um, but thanks very much for attending, and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you all.